what we're looking at for the next several weeks probably, I'm using a lot of illustrations in this study. Uh, because they're, they're honestly, because so many are available. This is not a hard study to be able to show you, look, this is what I'm talking about. This is one of those studies where the, it, it's not at all difficult to show you with pictures and, you know, illustrations. So, uh, we've been talking for the last five weeks, we were talking about the Antichrist, which, of course, we mentioned is a, uh, a figure that is, you know, uh, very popular in today's culture. Just about everybody on the planet has heard of the concept of the Antichrist, and we talked about that. And there is one other figure in prophecy, New Testament prophecy, that is extremely well-known. Oftentimes, people make jokes and say things uh, simply because I'm on talk plain tonight, because the word whore is in her name. People will say things like, oh, you're not talking about me, are you? <laughs> and, you know, and people, I had somebody online do something similar to that, you know, and people do that all the time. But it's, this is a figure that, uh, again, is something that uh, popular culture has heard of. They may not understand her in the least. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you. I grew up in the Pentecostal church. Here's another example, folks. I grew up in the Pentecostal church. And I never heard, never heard teaching related to this subject. Same here. Same here. Every once in a blue moon, a preacher might come through, an evangelist might come through who had an understanding of this. And he might kind of, you know, uh, pa passively, you know, mention something. But there was no clear teaching related to this subject. And this is an important subject to understand. Because when you understand this subject, you will all of a sudden, you're going to understand church history. You're going to understand Christian history. You're going to understand uh, how current events play into what is leading up to the unveiling of the Antichrist. You're going to understand why certain people have a vested interest uh, in the Antichrist. What, what is going to make them uh, even willing to, to deal with this figure, the Antichrist. So, so our previous study and this study actually have interlocking pieces. There are pieces to this that interlock. And I think you're going to find it immensely interesting. So let's move directly into it this evening, beginning at Revelation, the 17th chapter. Now this study will encompass Revelation, the 17th chapter, the 18th chapter, and the first three or four verses just depends on, on where you, you feel the need to stop it, but the first three or four verses of Revelation 19. You have to understand that the Word of God is not the, the uh, uh, chapter and verse uh, breaks are not necessarily according to subject matter. A lot of people make that mistake. Some people devise entire belief systems based on how passages are divided in the Word of God. And because the, 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 this particular passage ends at this chapter, and a new chapter begins, they think the writer has finished his thought and has moved on to a whole new... No, no, no. That is not why Scripture was divided numerically the way it was divided. It was only divided numerically to make it easier for all of us to read together, to study together, to understand together, so that you can refer to a specific location. All chapter and verse is, all they are, is a way for us to all find a certain place at the same time with greater ease. That's all it is. Just because one, one uh, chapter ends and a new chapter begins, 
It does not mean by any stretch of the imagination that the writer has finished the thought and has begun a new one. That's a major mistake. A lot of Christians, especially young Christians, people who don't understand the Word of God, that's a major mistake they make. And you can develop a lot of bad ideology and a lot of bad uh, theology if you do not understand what I'm telling you tonight. Revelation 17 in its entirety, Revelation chapter 18 in its entirety, going into the first three or four verses of chapter 19, all are dealing with the same exact subject matter. It's all, that's why that is what we're looking at. You know, you might say, well, why aren't we just studying Revelation 17, 18, and 19 in their entire chapter? Because all of 19 doesn't deal with this subject. Only the first few verses of 19 do. And if you try to include all of 19, you're going off into a whole nother line of thought. You're going off into an entirely new area. So we want to look specifically at 17, 18 and the first three verses of 19. Now, I am dividing it up by, oh, seven or eight verses at a clip. Because this study, unlike many that I do, is going to be almost at least, <clears throat> excuse me, a verse-by-verse -verse exegesis. This particular study, we're literally going to, we're going to look at this, I say almost, and the reason I say that is again, because in some instances, uh, three or four verses together are saying all one thing. So when I say a verse by verse almost, I mean we're going to go thought by thought through this entire uh, study, okay? So Revelation chapter 17, we're going to start with the first six verses this evening. And the word of God reads, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman. Let me go to my Bible. It's easier for me to read here. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast. Full of names of blasphemy. Having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So an angel comes to John during the course of his vision, uh, the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, He's on the Isle of Patmos. He's been exiled there, and God is revealing himself to John. The Bible calls John the apostle whom Jesus loved. The Lord loved all of his apostles, but apparently he had a very special, unique relationship with John. I believe part of that uh, relationship was based in the fact that John was the first apostle to really understand the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. In all of John's writings, 
John wrote about the divinity. That was the primary uh, emphasis of all John's writing, including his gospel. He wrote of the divinity of Jesus Christ. In his epistles, John wrote of the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe the Lord loved John. I believe the Lord had a special place, in, uh, that John had a special place in the Lord's heart because John got it before everybody else did. And I, I think that's what kind of won him a special place in the Lord's heart. Who better for the Lord Jesus Christ to manifest himself to in all his glory, in all his divinity, in all his power. Who better to reveal to, uh, for the benefit of the church universal, past, present, and future, who better than John? Nobody. This guy gets things that other people don't get. This guy understands things before other people can understand it. And the Lord chose John to write what is the only prophetic book in the New Testament. One thing that is important to understand, God speaks a prophetic language. And the interesting thing about John's vision is, John's vision was revealed to him in God's divine prophetic language. And what I mean by that is, in prophetic dialogue, in prophetic language, certain terms mean certain things. It is not literal necessarily. There are some things which may be literal in those cases it's abundantly obvious, but there are those times when things are represented in a form. If you remember, for instance, going back to uh, the Babylonian king and the vision that he had and the, uh, Daniel's explaining the vision to him of the great monument and how the feet were made of clay and other parts of the monument were made of other materials, you know. Uh, obviously, he was not speaking of a literal monument or a literal idol, but this was referring to the kingdom that uh, the king oversaw and all this sort of thing. So there's language that is representative. There is language that is used uh, that illustrates and helps you to understand concepts. And... God uses the same language with John in the book of Revelation that he used with Daniel in the Old Testament, that he used with Isaiah in the Old Testament, that he used with Hosea, that he used with Ezekiel, all the prophets. God uses the same language, and the language that he uses has the same meaning. In this passage, at the beginning of the book of Revelation, <clears throat> the angel comes to John and says, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. So first of all, you have to understand that the angel is telling John, what I'm about to show you is about judgment. This is not, I am not merely telling you who this woman is. I am showing you the judgment that is about to befall her. Do you follow what I'm telling you? You know, this is not just God showing us who a certain figure in history is. No, 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 no. You've got to understand from the get-go that this figure, before the, before the angel of God, before the Spirit of the Lord has shown John anything more, he starts right off at the starting line and says, this is a vile creature who is worthy of the judgment of God. Wow. Wow. Now, John, you've got to understand, at this point, John is clueless. He, he doesn't even know what he's seeing. He doesn't even understand what he's looking at, okay? But the angel is telling him, I'm going to show you the judgment of this great whore that sitteth upon many waters. All right, so John's hearing this, and he's, okay, a great whore that sits upon many waters. Now, we understand prophetic language 
Number one, a whore is someone who is unfaithful. It's not a prostitute. Prostitute's something different. <laughs> prostitute's not unfaithful. A prostitute is someone who sells their goods, okay? They sell their goodies. Not, they're not giving it away. In the prophetic terminology, the term whore refers to one who is unfaithful. Throughout the Old Testament, God refers to the people of Israel whoring. Okay, meaning they're not being faithful to me. They are not being faithful to that religion and that faith which I set forth for them, which is in fact a relationship between Israel and myself. Do you follow them? Now the interesting thing is, in the Old Testament, and I hope you all pay, I'm telling you, some of this is cool. In the Old Testament, God is in relationship with a man. God is in relationship in the Old Testament with Israel. Israel is the nation, but Israel is male. In the Old Testament, God is in relationship with Israel. Israel. He's in relationship with Abraham. Everything that God does in the Old Testament is in relationship to his relationship and his promise and his covenant with the man Abraham. Now, God speaks of Israel as being his wife or being his bride well if you're married you're expected you see a lot of people don't understand why God said in the Ten Commandments thou shall not commit adultery you see we think that's all about a moral code no 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 it is taking a spiritual principle and putting it into a practical application because human beings cannot understand spiritual principles we have to have it made practical for us just like many people come to church to listen to the pastor preach because they can read the Bible all day and all night and have no clue what they're reading. They don't understand what they're looking at. They need somebody who can break it down and kind of present it to them in a fashion. Well, what does this have to do with me? How does this apply to me? Right? And there's nothing wrong with that. But the reality is human beings, when we fell, when Adam disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden and he fell from his first estate, Adam no longer had a spiritual mind. He was now carnally minded. And carnally minded men, the word of God tells us, cannot understand the things of God. So when God gave the law to Moses, and when you understand this, I'm telling you, it puts things into such perspective. When, when God gave the law to Moses, he gave them this explicit, lengthy list of rules and regulations, do's and don'ts, all of which illustrate spiritual concepts and spiritual principles. That was the whole reason. Paul the Apostle tells us the Old Testament is types and shadows. It's, it's illustrative. It helps you to understand uh, important spiritual principles that Adam in his fallen state, man in his fallen state, could not understand except that it be broken down and put into some kind of terms that he could get his mind around. When God said to Moses on the Mount Sinai, he said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. God is trying to give an illustration to humanity. How can you understand what it is to be faithful to me in relationship if you cannot make a commitment to another human being and be faithful in that commitment? Do you follow? Yeah. You see? Yeah. It's very easy. It's a spiritual principle here. 
And so when you read the term whore, <clears throat> God is always speaking of someone who is supposed to be in relationship with himself. Now in the New Testament era, that would no longer be Israel. No, in the New Testament, who would that woman be? Well, it would be the church. It would be those that call themselves Christians. God is saying, there is a body that calls itself my bride who is not being faithful to me. And this body sits upon Many waters. Now in prophetic language, many waters refers to the fact that it covers the globe or that it has a very wide reach. There are members, there are participants, there are believers all over the world from many different lands, many different nations. When you see the term of many waters, that's what it refers to. It's speaking of many nations, many peoples, okay? So he said, there is a body, there is this entity that claims to be in relationship with me, that covers the world. They, they, they are all over the place, but they're not being faithful. And I'm going to judge her. And I'm, the angel says, I'm going to show you my judgment of her. See, God don't play easy with people who play games with him. If you're going to be in relationship with God, be in relationship with God. Don't play games. Historically, there, there is a body that has done nothing but play games with God. And we're going to get there in a minute. Keep following with me. He continues in verse 2 and said, With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Aha! With whom the kings of the earth have commit fornication. Fornication is different than whoredom. Fornication can include prostitution. Fornication can include rape. Fornication can include incest. He says, this entity, not only has she whored around, but she has gotten involved in the political world. And she has worked with world leaders and done things with world leaders that involve her selling herself. Oh, I'll do this for you if you can give me this. Forcing the act upon the other individual. Rape. Forcing it. Applying pressure. Using your political might to accomplish your ends. Aha. Whoa, this character. This character really goes well beyond whoredom. This isn't just somebody who is stepping out on God, but this is somebody who's gotten deeply political, very deeply involved. And they're using all kinds of ungodly techniques and tactics to accomplish things in the political realm. He goes on to say, the angel that is, to John, that she has made the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he said not only has she gotten involved in political realms, but her behavior and her conduct now has not only affected the leadership worldwide, but it has affected citizens worldwide. Not just the kings, but the inhabitants as well. The matter of fact, some of her foolishness has so affected people and nations 
that they have become utterly drunk with the wine of her fornication. They have bought into her so heavily and so seriously that you could describe them prophetically, this is prophetic language, as being drunk or inebriated. There are some countries in our world today that are far more deeply influenced by certain religious systems than other countries. There are some countries that you could say have been made drunk on the wine of her fornication because they literally, that whole country, is almost entirely swallowed up by this particular religious system. Yeah. I'm, I'm not saying who yet because I'm, I'm trying to build a little bit of... Uh, you're going to find out, and when you do, you're going to know. Because I don't want to say it and then have somebody say, well, I don't believe that and turn me off and say, well, I'm not going to listen to the rest of it. No, no, you need to hang in there because I promise you, this is abundantly clear. There can be no misunderstanding. So the Word of God said in verse 3, <clears throat> Revelation 17, So he carried me away in the Spirit into the wilderness, and I saw. Now, mind you, up until now, all John has done is heard about this woman, okay? He hadn't seen anything. The angel comes in, here, I'm going to show you this woman, this whore that sits upon many waters. So John's hearing this. Now the angel carries him into the wilderness where he is now literally physically seeing a prophetic image. This for John is a literal image. This is not, he's not seeing something different and describing it in this way. No, this is what he has seen. But it is a prophetic vision. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Now, I'm going to kind of pass through this a little quickly. I'm going to tell you why. Because we're going to, in our next portion of Scripture, the angel says to John, now I'm going to tell you what all this is. So if I tell you what all this is, then I'm going ahead of myself, all right? So you're going to see what all of this, uh, all of this prophetic uh, display, what all of this means. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, and with the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So John sees this incredible vision. He sees this woman who sits upon many waters. He sees her sitting upon a scarlet colored beast. She's wearing purple, the color of royalty. She's got a golden cup in her hand full of abominations. says that this woman is, uh, let me see here. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Now, to help you understand the concept of many waters in prophetic language, Verse number one, he said, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. This woman is described in prophetic language as sitting upon many waters, which implies that she has worldwide influence over people. The waters represent people. There has been very little time in the history of the Christian church that Rome did not have worldwide influence. 
Rome. I'm talking, not talking at the moment about the Roman Catholic Church. I'm talking about Rome. The city of Rome, the government of Rome, the Roman Empire. Rome was also commonly referred to as Babylon in biblical times, in New Testament times, as she was the hotbed of paganism and heathenism coupled with idolatry and every conceivable form of wickedness and fornication. The Roman organization today, the Roman Catholic organization, has membership in the billions reaching into virtually every nation on earth. Here's an illustration. The darker the blue, you start out at a light gray, and as you go up the darker the blue, that is the percentage of people in that country who identify as Roman Catholic. Now, do you see how much of that map is very dark blue or dark blue? Then you have other areas that are a lighter blue, and then you get down to the kind of a light gray. The light gray would be less than 10% of the population is Roman Catholic. Then you get to the light blue, like the United States, for instance, and that is between 20 and 30% of the population is Roman Catholic. When you get up into the dark blue colors, uh, not the darkest, but just beneath that, 80 to 90% are identified as Roman Catholic. The darkest blue would be the uh, 90 to 100% of the people identify as Roman Catholic. So this shows you that there is not one edge or corner of the world that Catholicism has not touched. You don't see a single country there that is uh, white. No, every single one of them at least has somewhere between 1 and 10% of the population is Roman Catholic. And then there are other countries that gets up to as many as uh, uh, anywhere from 90 to 100% of the people identify as Roman Catholic. In verse 2 it said, With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. The entity described here is said to have committed fornication with the kings of the earth. This clearly speaks to her political nature. Common men do not have the ability to even deal or speak with royalty. But this organization has the ability to not only speak with kings, but also to sleep with them, meaning that she is able to offer mutually beneficial services. She can do for them if they will do for her. Fornication is used in prophetic writings to speak of spiritual compromise. Now, we're getting to the point where John sees the vision. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy. The beast is full of names of blasphemy. The beast itself is full of names of blasphemy. Names of blasphemy. What are names of blasphemy? Names of blasphemy would be false gods. Blasphemy is to pay homage and to give honor to false gods. The beast is full of names of blasphemy, having seven horns, excuse me, seven heads and ten horns. Now, and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. In case you haven't figured it out yet, folks, the woman we're talking about, we're, you're going to learn momentarily, is the city. The woman 
is specifically spoken of as being a city. It is the center of government, the center of operations for an organization which is the beast. That is why she sits upon the beast, okay? She is in control, she is in charge of the beast. But this city, we're going to learn about this in a few minutes, this city is none other than Rome, Italy. It is none other than Vatican City, which is at the heart of Rome, Italy. You're going you're gonna to figure out here real soon, folks. Hang in there with me. Don't, don't quit on me yet. Watch the pageantry of the Roman Catholic Church when a pontiff dies or a new one is installed. What are the most commonly used colors? Scarlet. Now, in my research, writers, secular writers will refer to the color of cardinals as being red. And then in parentheses they say, or as is formally called, scarlet. The Roman Catholic Church formally calls the color scarlet. They do not call it red, they call it scarlet. The color of cardinals, red, scarlet, spoken of in scripture only when describing sin and ungodly filth and impurity. When God speaks of scarlet, he said, though your sins be as scarlet. But the church says, oh, but this is to represent the blood of Christ. Well, that's all right. It's all well and good that you want to call it that. But the Bible says that scarlet is representative of sin and filth. Do you understand what I'm telling you today, folks? In Isaiah 118, the word of God said, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. In Lamentations 4 and 5, They that did feed delicately are desolate in the streets. They that were brought up in scarlet embrace dunghills. So scarlet is not spoken of in the most popular terms. Yet interestingly enough, Rome does not identify the color they use as red. No, 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 no. They specifically go to the Roman Encyclopedia, the Catholic Encyclopedia. They specifically refer to the, any shade that they use of a red as scarlet. Now, here's some illustrations for you all. Here's a Roman altar. Isn't it interesting the color choices that they use? Here we have the College of Cardinals. Gathered together all arrayed in scarlet. Here we have the Pope arrayed in scarlet. Here we have the pageantry of the Roman Church. Look at all the scarlet. Oh, wait a minute. But then there's another color they like to use as well. Besides scarlet, they also like to use purple. You see, in this instance, many of the uh, cardinals are wearing scarlet. Others are wearing purple. Here you go. Oh, how we love purple. Purple, we love it. Oh, look there, scarlet and purple in the same picture. The foreground is scarlet, the background is purple. Any shade that is of a purpley nature, they refer to as purple. Here's Pope John Paul II with his purple garb on. Purple is the color of royalty. The Roman Catholic Church has assigned a different uh, meaning to purple. They try to describe purple as, as representing something different. But isn't it funny how, you know, the Word of God represents things one way and they just turn around, they use it, and then they say, oh, but for us it means something different. 
Purple represents royalty. That's one reason why I can't stand this purple carpet in this place. Okay, we are not ostentatious. We are not one of those churches that runs around thinking believers are, you know, supposed to be, you know, doing all this high-minded stuff. One day soon, when we have the money, we will replace this. Purple is the color of royalty. Our Lord was lent a purple garment so that the Roman soldiers might mock him as a king. If you look at John chapter 19, verses 1 through 5, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers planted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said unto them, Behold the man. It's another illustration. The wearing of purple speaks of one sitting as royalty. Does that not look more like a king to you than a priest? The term pope, this, mind you, is according to, I'm taking this definition directly from the Roman Catholic Encyclopedia. Okay, this is their official definition. This is not my words, but theirs. Pope, Latin, Papa. From Greek, Papas, Father. The title since about the ninth century of the Bishop of Rome, the head of the Roman Catholic Church. It was formerly, formerly given, especially from the third to the fifth century, to any bishop and sometimes to simple priests as an ecclesiastical title expressing affectionate respect. It is still used in the East for the Orthodox Patriarch of Alexandria and for Orthodox priests. Now listen, the Annuario Pontifico the official directory of the Holy See describes the office of the Pope by the following titles. Bishop of Rome, Vicar of Jesus Christ, Successor of the Prince of the Apostles, Supreme Pontiff of the Universal Church, Patriarch of the West, Primate of Italy, Metropolitan Archbishop of the Province of Rome. Now look at this title. This is all part of the Pope's official titles. Sovereign of the State of Vatican City. Servant of the Servants of God. The title Pope or Papa, abbreviated PP is officially used only as a less solemn style. Sovereign of the state of Vatican City, folks. Do you know what a sovereign is? A king. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump, although he may think he is, is not a sovereign. <laughs> the British... Prime Minister is not a sovereign. No, Queen Elizabeth is a sovereign. The Prime Minister is a... No president, no Prime Minister is a sovereign. No, sovereign is specifically reserved for those who have absolute authority as a monarch. If you look underneath here in smaller writing, I have... The Oxford Dictionary describes sovereign a noun, a supreme ruler, especially a monarch. 
So when you see the Pope running about, you're not only looking at a religious leader, you're also looking at a political leader because he is the head of state. Not only is he a head of state, but he is not called the president of Vatican City. He is called the sovereign of Vatican City. Vatican City at the heart of Rome has its own laws, its own rules, and you cannot, it is a sovereign nation. They can do or, or they can enforce any rule they want to enforce. They can ignore any rule they want to ignore in Vatican City. They're under absolutely, folks, there's an old saying. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. This particular organization literally has at its heart leadership that has absolute power. Power. Do you have any idea how scary that is? We got people today scared to death about Donald Trump. We got an organization in our world that is both religious in facade and political, and we don't even think for a minute. We don't stop for a minute and worry about it and what it's capable of doing. But it's capable of doing an awful lot. That looks more like a king to me than a priest. That looks more like a king to me than a servant. And so does this. I don't ever see the Pope sitting in a folding chair. Why, I've never seen a Pope sitting in a folding chair. Today, the Roman pontiff wears purple as a king when the Bible clearly teaches in John 13, 16, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. Neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. Are you going to tell me that Jesus in his lifetime lived a life and a lifestyle greater than that of the old bachelor in Rome? Hardly. 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, nor for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Luke chapter 22, verses 25 through 27. And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. What is a benefactor? Somebody who benefits from your labor, from your effort, from your work. But ye shall not be so, but he that is greater among you let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that doth serve. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you as he that serveth. And the Lord was not talking here in figurative language, he was literally saying, I literally serve you. I literally do things for you. I literally, I'm not sitting up here in, in a castle, living like a king, and saying, oh, but I'm your servant. I'm your servant. Yes, 
Uh, yes, I'm called to king. Yes, I benefit from all your labor and all your work. And yes, I have my own chef and I live alone, but every one of my meals are made by a chef, you know. Yes, you know, I wear garments that cost millions of dollars. The Lord is not, uh, the servant is not above his Lord. Something is wrong, folks, with anything that calls itself Christian and yet embraces this kind of exorbitance. Everywhere the, the Pope goes, all of his, all of his subservients are kissing his ring and kissing his hand. Jesus didn't even experience this. Jesus didn't demand this. Jesus didn't ask for this. No, Jesus washed his disciples' feet. Matthew 23, 8 through 12. But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father on the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. The, Jesus literally, and I believe he did so knowing exactly the tradition that would come later in time, specifically said, you call no man your spiritual father. Yet Rome expects and teaches every single one of its members to call their priest father, to call the Pope Papa, in direct contradiction, folks, to the teachings of, not the apostles, Jesus Christ. In direct contradiction. That's what you call fornication. That's what you call spitting in the face of your husband and doing what you're going to do anyway. Hello now, you're supposed to be married to him. What is the central figure in the Roman Mass? A golden chalice, a golden cup, which her priests lift up toward heaven and then declare to contain the actual blood of Christ. This very claim constitutes an abomination, as God has declared that the drinking of blood is an abomination. This prohibition is also repeated by the apostles in the New Testament for the Gentile churches to observe in Acts 15, 19, and 20. Wherefore my sentence is this, that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. God is not going to tell you don't drink blood and then he's going to turn around and fill a cup with, the, with blood and say now drink this. When Jesus spoke of you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood and people were turned away by his words. He said the words that I speak unto you they are spirit in their life. He said I'm talking this is spiritual. This is not a literal thing. This, I'm not asking you to literally drink my blood. This is a spiritual concept, a spiritual principle. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, it is a spiritual exercise that we are engaging in. It is not literal. We do not think for a moment. However, Roman theology has evolved so that Catholic people around the world are taught when they take communion, they are literally, folks, 
literally eating the body of Christ. The priest, by reason of his ordination, has the power of transubstantiation. When he lifts the host, as the bread is called, up toward heaven, he has the magic power to turn it into the literal body of Christ. At that moment, it literally becomes the body of Christ. When he lifts up the chalice, he has that magic power, a transubstantiation, and it becomes the literal blood of Christ. That is what they're taught. And I mean, this is literal. You wonder why it says this woman has a cup full of abomination? A golden chalice in her hand. What's the central figure in the Roman church? It's all about that chalice. It's all about that chalice. You see, look at their altar. They've got their beautiful ornate chalices up there, right? You've got all these bejeweled chalices. Now let's... Here's the priest holding up the cup, according to Roman teaching, at this moment in time, it is literally turned into the, the blood of Christ. Literally, literally. Once again, here you go. Now look at that golden chalice he's holding. Does that look like a $5.99 dollar store chalice to you? Look at some of these beautiful examples. The woman's adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. Now what do those look like to you? What would you call those? I don't know about you, they look like a wedding cake. But it's supposed to be worn on the head of the Pope, I would call that a crown. They call it a tiara. Can you imagine them giving a tiara like this to the winner of the Miss America or the Miss Universe pageant? She wouldn't be able to hold up her head. That is not... But do you see how they try very craftily, folks? I'm telling you, those of you who think Donald Trump and his lies and his distortions, this organization is all about all of that. They've been playing that game for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of of years. They have one thing that is clearly one thing and they'll call it something different. You've got the Pope who is clearly a king but they call him a servant. Oh, but you don't understand. He's the humble servant of the church. If you remember in our definition of all his titles it said servant of the servants of God. Oh my, what a humble sounding title. Of course, the servant of the servants of God lives in what amounts to be a castle yeah. and lives like a king and never sets his bum down not one time on a, God forbid, on a folding chair. <laughs> Everywhere he goes, oh no, he, even in the vehicle he's carried in, you know, there's a throne there for him. Good grief. Queen Elizabeth drives around in a Rolls Royce. She's sitting on a seat in the car just like anybody else sits on a seat in the car. Everywhere you go, you don't see. They haven't installed a throne in the back of her Rolls Royce for her, have they? No. No. It's a regular chair. It's a regular seat like in any other car. Now, yeah, it's a much more expensive car, but it's still a car seat, all right? Yeah, this is called a tiara. Because after all, we're all stupid and blind. And we look at this and we say, oh yeah, a tiara, yeah, yeah, I see it. Then we look. And there's a reason I'm, I'm showing these things tonight. You're going to see it momentarily. Here are just some examples of the vestments that are worn by priests. Look at the tapestry. Look at the embroidery. Embroidery. Look at the bejewelment. Do you have any clue in the world how much some of these garments are worth? You, you would, it would blow your mind. Some of the most basic garments that are worn by local priests, I did my research because I was curious. Some of the most basic vestments worn by priests 
in a local Catholic church can cost upwards of $500. I don't even own a $500 suit. <laughs> and Martin, that's one. That's one. They have dozens of these things. They've got a different one for every day. they got a different this for every festival. they got a different sash for every, you know. Everything is all laid out. They have a wardrobe for the priest that is worth tens of thousands of dollars. Yes, they do. Just to preach what they call the gospel? You've got to be kidding me. I get up here and preach in front of you in whatever clothes I own. There is no, it, no, we're all brethren, Jesus said. The Word of God said, we're all brethren. I don't have to get up. There is no need for me to identify myself by my clothing in any manner different than you. There's no need for that. It's unnecessary. And by trying to do so, what we actually are doing, and, and this is one reason why we Pentecostal folk don't use vestments and what have you, is because it is an effort to trick the eye, put a robe on somebody, all of a sudden they look holy. Well, they could be a child molester. All of a sudden they look holy. They could be committing adultery with a lady in the church. A priest in the town I grew up in uh, wound up doing that, and he ran off with a lady in the church. And oh, but every Sunday he looked so holy in his garments. No, we don't do that in God's church. Nowhere in the teaching of the apostles were ministers ever taught to distinguish themselves in their appearance from the rest of the body. Nowhere. And there are all kinds, of, and I'm sorry my black friends, y'all are going to get mad at me, but this is one reason why I have a problem with a, a lot of what goes on in a lot of black churches. They follow after the tradition of Mother Rome. I mean, they go with the hat the whole nine yards. It is unscriptural. It is unbiblical. Do not tell me you are apostolic and you are running around wearing priestly garb. That is crap. It is garbage. You are a liar. I'm just, I'm just telling it plain because I get so sick and tired of seeing it. I see it online. Churches that call themselves apostolic and the preachers run around with all kinds of robes and all kinds of hats. Where did the apostles ever teach you to do such a thing? How can you identify? No. No, you're usurping the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ to embrace your own tradition. All right, we're, we're almost at the very end of our time. And upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Her name begins with the word mystery. Like her predecessor, Babylon, she is a very secretive organization. Much of what is done by the leadership of the organization is done in secret. Much of her belief system is based upon the concept of mysteries. The Roman Catholic Church is full of so-called mysteries. They refer to the mystery of the Mass, the mystery of transubstantiation, the mystery of the Trinity. They refer to the Trinity as a mystery. It's because it don't make sense. <laughs> Babylon is a title commonly attributed to Rome in the days of John who wrote this book. In New Testament era times, it was common for the Jewish people especially, but others as well, to refer to Rome as Babylon. Why? Because it looked so much like the ancient Babylon which was since destroyed. But they would call Rome Babylon. How many times, you know, do people say, oh, yeah, you know, um, New Orleans, you know, that's Sodom. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's the same, the same idea. People think that in biblical times they didn't do things like this, but they did. It was common to refer to Rome, the city of Rome, as Babylon because they recognized 
that the Roman Empire and its headquarter city very much resembled the headquarters of the Babylonian Empire. Like Rome, Babylon was a great city, once the capital of both a great political and religious system that had influence around the world. That's as far as I'm going to be able to get tonight. Stay with me on this study because uh, in our next session, the angel comes to John and tells John, I will tell thee the mystery of the woman. Because if you remember at the end of our reading today, John was left beguiled. He's looking at this vision, and the Bible said that he was astonished at what he was seeing. So he's just like, wow, wow, what is this? You know, he has no concept of what he's seeing. And at this point, next week, the angel is going to come to John and say, I will show you who this woman is. And there is no doubt whatsoever who this woman is, folks. There is no doubt. There are, uh, there are secular authorities. There are people who do documentaries and things for television shows and programs like on the History Channel and all that sort of thing. And they have tried to explain how that uh, Romans, excuse me, Revelation 17, 18, uh, describes Rome. They know it does. They're, they're like, there's no way in the world it doesn't describe Rome. But they try to blame it on, well, you know, John just sat down and wrote all this, and he was ticked off at Rome because, after all, Rome was controlling all of Palestine at the time. You know, Rome was controlling all of Judea at the time. And that's why, you know, he had a, a, a stick up his craw, you know. And that's their explanation. But there is no misunderstanding what this is about, folks. And you need to understand this, and you will really find this deeply interesting. Are you finding it pretty interesting so far? Yeah. Do you see the fornication that I was talking about? Do you see how the Word of God says one thing, but they're turning around doing what they want to do for their own reasons anyway? All right, a lot of compromise. That's the whole concept of spiritual fornication. It's compromise and, uh, and rebellion and rejection of God's truth. All right, would you stand with me this evening?